Hello and welcome. I'm honored to receive the Colvin Prize for Research in Mood Disorders. My professional life, uh, I have been interested in genetics of bipolar disorder and how it can inform the clinical care. And this will be the overarching uh, theme of uh, my presentation. Clinical care of bipolar disorder can be logical and rational if it is guided by research findings uh, in clinical medicine and molecular genetics. And uh, I would like to start with a clinical example. Uh, let me also stress uh, that the case is based on a true case history, but has been heavily altered to protect identity of all the persons involved. So this was a person, let's call her AB, who was a mother of four children, and we saw her for a family study of bipolar disorder when she was 49 years old. And her history was as follows. At 16 years, she had an episode of depression that lasted for a few weeks and uh, which was briefly treated. Later in her 20s, she had multiple episodes uh, of hypomania, of elevated mood, increased activity, uh, decreased need for sleep, and rapid speech. Then, when she was 28 years old, uh, she had postpartum depression, and uh, another such episode uh, when she was 31 years old, and at that time she was seen by a psychiatrist and prescribed lithium. She responded within two weeks, and then she took lithium for over 20 years uh, and was completely stable and did not require any other uh, treatment intervention. And then we learned that when she was 54, uh, her family physician gradually stopped her lithium and replaced it with another medication as uh, the doctor was concerned about a uh, small decrease uh, in her kidney function. And then a year later, AB died by suicide. This is her family tree. And uh, as you can see, she comes uh, from a family of uh, many people with mood disorders and two siblings of her mother also died by suicide. So what comes to mind uh, uh, if we uh, look at a case like this? There are a number of clinical questions. How can we determine that somebody is at risk of bipolar disorder and how soon that person should start treatment? Can we also replace one effective treatment with another? What are the risks and benefits of long-term treatment in psychiatry? And also, can we tell that somebody is at high risk of uh, committing suicide? All that uh, can be also summarized by the aphorism of William Osler that medicine is a science of uncertainty and an art of probability. This uh, busy slide uh, shows uh, a typical trajectory of somebody with uh, bipolar disorder. Often these people develop uh, early signs of depression, then it takes years often before they get properly diagnosed, and then when they are diagnosed with bipolar disorder, uh, they go through repeated trials of different medications, each lasted months, uh, before something is found to work. And ideally, we would like to be able to uh, provide uh, these patients with much faster uh, treatment uh, after comprehensive assessment uh, to be able to carry out uh, a genetic test or study biological markers that would tell us that indeed this person with prodromal symptoms uh, has uh, in fact bipolar disorder and uh, is most likely to respond to treatment A or B or C. This is critical because uh, especially early stages of the illness uh, are uh, often complicated by high risk of suicide, like in this panel on the left side where uh, out of uh, 700 uh, plus uh, uh, families, uh, people with bipolar disorder uh, had the highest risk of suicide in the first five years of treatment. And uh, in a study of mortality of uh, bipolar disorder in Sweden, 
uh, it is obvious that uh, most uh, elevated risk uh, of uh, premature death is in people with early onset uh, of bipolar disorder. So how do we pick the treatment right now? Well, the current uh, Canadian uh, guidelines uh, in uh, cooperation with the International Society for Bipolar Disorder list nine treatments that can be viewed as uh, first-line options and another seven treatments uh, that uh, are uh, considered second-line options. But how do we choose among those? Well, let's start with the one that is on top of uh, the list, uh, lithium, which is a fascinating drug. Uh, it is one of the oldest psychotropic medications and uh, coincidentally also one of the oldest uh, elements in the entire universe. And uh, besides being uh, a first-line mood stabilizer, it has also some other unique uh, properties. Uh, it is uh, considered uh, effective for reducing the risk of suicide. It is uh, found to be neuroprotective. And at the same time, many clinicians uh, perceive it as difficult to use. Some of the first studies uh, of uh, prophylactic effect of uh, lithium in bipolar disorder came from a Danish psychiatrist, Morgan Skoll and uh, Paul Bastrup. Uh, Morgan Skoll is the person on the right on this uh, group picture, together with the other uh, fathers of lithium therapy, so to say, Bruno Miller Erlinghausen and uh, Paul Grof. And uh, on this cartoon, we see uh, life charts of people treated with lithium. And uh, closer inspection will show that uh, there are both people in whom lithium stops completely the cycle of depressions and manias, so like here with the red arrow. And then there are people indicated by the blue arrows uh, who, in spite of, effective, uh, in spite of uh, therapeutic uh, uh, levels of lithium, continue experiencing uh, episodes uh, of uh, depression or mania. In our work with families, we also could not not notice that there are families where everybody treated with lithium response, like the two families uh, shown on top of the uh, slide, uh, where uh, three all three uh, family members treated with lithium did well. And then there are families uh, where nobody treated with lithium gets well. Now, this is not easy to study on a large scale because uh, we need um, large samples. And uh, in fact, uh, for our study of uh, familiarity of lithium response, we had to uh, join forces with several clinics uh, in Italy and Poland uh, to get a sufficiently large uh, sample. We also had to devise and validate a scale that would allow a reliable assessment uh, of lithium response across all the centers. And uh, we now use this scale in our genetic studies and uh, the scale has been adopted uh, by many research groups worldwide. So in this study of 92 families, uh, we were able to see that if you respond to lithium, your relatives have about 70% probability of doing well on lithium as well. Conversely, if you did not do well on lithium, your relatives uh, will have only about 20% chance of responding. So translated into statistical terms, this is an odds of about eight times uh, in favor of uh, relatives of people uh, who did well on lithium. Now, our other question was uh, whether we could tell just based on clinical features, on clinical features alone, 
that a person would be likely to do well with lithium treatment. And again, combining uh, forces uh, and data from clinics uh, in Europe and Canada, uh, we were able to study almost 1,300 people on long-term lithium treatment and submitted their detailed clinical data to machine learning analysis. And uh, here we see the performance of that classification uh, uh, reflected as the area under the curve for uh, accuracy of the classification. That is around 80% for the combined sample, which is, uh, which is a value that is already considered clinically useful and can inform clinical decisions. We took it uh, a few steps further and we asked whether actually these responders and non-responders could be differentiated uh, genetically based just on genetic markers, no other uh, traits. And uh, we did a study in which we selected the most prototypical best uh, lithium uh, responders and non-responders that we called exemplars. And uh, indeed, we were able to see that uh, they could be classified using genome-wide genetic data with accuracy of over 80% again, while the poor exemplars, people where the classification of their response was not as precise, uh, could not be also differentiated uh, reliably by uh, genetic uh, markers alone. Also, when we submitted the genetic markers to what's called pathway analysis uh, to see which types of genes uh, are overrepresented among those genes that uh, would uh, allow the accurate classification, we see that in the uh, prototypical lithium responders and non-responders, the genes that differentiate uh, uh, these two groups uh, cluster uh, in meaningful pathways that uh, have to do with uh, cellular signaling uh, and nerve cell functions, but in the poor exemplars, quote-unquote, we could not see really any enrichment for any particular gene families. Now, if you remember our first case, uh, the, the patient uh, did not do well after switching to another medication. And uh, so we wanted to look specifically if uh, the uh, patients who respond to one medication would do the same way, uh, the same well uh, on, on different classes. So here we had uh, 1,400 patients uh, treated with lithium and close to 300 uh, people treated with uh, anticonvulsants, uh, valproate, and lamotrigine. And we see, first of all, that lithium response could be predicted more accurately uh, uh, for lithium. Uh, that, uh, that is uh, about 81% classification accuracy versus 70% accuracy for anticonvulsants. And there are certain clinical features that would uh, differentiate uh, better responders to lithium uh, specifically low rates of psychosis, low rates of comorbid anxiety, clearly episodic course before treatment, and uh, low rates of schizophrenia and anxiety disorders uh, in their families. On the other hand, uh, the anticonvulsant response uh, was better in people who had uh, low rates of uh, suicide behavior before their treatment. This study also uh, highlighted certain clinical features that uh, would uh, identify people unlikely to do well with either treatment, especially those with a very chronic course of illness uh, before they get treated, people with rapid cycling, and not surprisingly, people uh, with uh, substance abuse. So taken together, this data would suggest that uh, there are uh, more than one genetic types of uh, bipolar disorder. And uh, we had uh, the privilege to collaborate uh, with uh, uh, research groups at Salk Institute that uh, work with uh, neurons derived from 
stem cells. And these stem cells are prepared from either skin or uh, blood cells uh, of people uh, with either bipolar disorder or healthy, healthy people. And uh, when these cells are tested uh, in a laboratory dish, we see that uh, cells from uh, people with bipolar disorder are hyper excitable. Their electric firing is uh, much more frequent uh, and of higher amplitude than cells of people uh, who uh, don't have bipolar disorder. Even more interestingly, when the cells from people who have responded clinically to lithium are exposed to lithium in a tissue culture, the electric activity of these cells normalizes. But when you do the same with cells from people who did not do well clinically with lithium, nothing happens. So these are exciting findings that may open a uh, door to both predicting treatment response, but also to screening for new medications, new effective treatments for bipolar disorder. So to conclude, I would like to convince you that, uh, that uh, people with bipolar disorder need to be diagnosed correctly and they need to be treated early to minimize the dangers associated with untreated illness, especially dangers associated with early stages of bipolar disorder. The clinical management uh, can and should take advantage uh, of uh, research findings. And uh, there, both uh, detailed clinical data, family history, and molecular markers can be useful to allow us to decide when to use lithium and when to look for alternatives. And uh, finally, uh, we have uh, seen that uh, groups of patients that are defined based uh, on their clinical characteristics can be also differentiated by their genetic markers and that the validity of these groups is supported by cellular phenotyping. And uh, now I would like just to give thanks to, first of all, our patients and their families. They have been wonderful participants uh, and partners in our research for more than two decades. And without them, uh, you would not be see, you would not be able to see these uh, these uh, uh, results. I would also like to thank uh, my mentors, uh, especially Paul Graf and Peter Zwolski, and uh, friends and colleagues, Girulo and Gustavo Turecki. Uh, with uh, both, uh, I've collaborated for about 25 years, and it's a special honor to share the Colvin Prize with Gustavo. And uh, also, I extend my thanks to the research support uh, through many research organizations and foundations. Uh, I've been fortunate uh, to receive uh, uh, independent investigator awards uh, from NARSAT or Brain Behavior Research Foundation and mentored uh, several junior investigators. And uh, I've also been fortunate to get funded through CIHR, Canadian Institutes of Health Research, Genome Canada, and uh, other agencies. Thank you very much.